Greetings, everyone. We're live again with our Sound United webinars. It's been a while indeed, and that's because our colleagues in San Diego have been very busy finalizing our amazing headquarters in Carlsbad, California. And today we're starting with part one, uh, which is our kind of live housewarming. Our special guest for today is Dave Naber, our Class A brand director. Welcome back, Dave. I hope you were able to get some rest. Yeah, thank you, Frederick. Frederick, it was uh, kind of a short <laughs> night, but uh, yeah, good rest. So happy to be here. Okay, so Dave and Phil are joining us from the new building, and they will talk about what that we have done in terms of room design, acoustic bottling, speaker and subwoofer placement, and so on. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand it over to Phil and Dave, live from our new office in Carlsbad. Take it away, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. It's been a while since we have talked, and we have been working really hard over, as Frederick said, over the past few months, um, putting together our new Sound United headquarters in Southern California. We have the whole building. We have engineering, design, marketing, sales, and we have an experience center here where we can bring in uh, clients, dealers, um, um, and enthusiasts to show them um, different demonstrations of different types of Sound United product. Now, Sound United owns a huge amount of product, a whole huge amount of brands, and we offer a whole lot of products. But we can't put everything in this building. But we want to talk today about the decisions we made um, in order to give the our customers, our dealers, and our visitors the experience of what types of products and ben and the, the benefits of those products um, that Sound United offers. So the building is brand new, and I we had the opportunity to to go and work with people like Johan and Derek and Frederick and my man Dave to determine what goes in each of the spaces. Before um, we talk about the sound rooms, let's talk about this. Is give you a real quick tour of the facility. So the first thing is when you come into this lobby, it's pretty obvious that we wanted to say that we are an audio company. So if you look in the back, you'll see that real that large um, the um, display with all the circles. Well, those circles are speakers, and a whole whole lot um, of speakers. So you can see we wanted to have this wall of sound. This is a pretty big wall. So um, and you'll notice in our multi-zone system that I actually put in several um, Class A multi-channels because. At right now, we're running eight of these speakers. I want to see how many I can actually run because it's supposed to be a wall of sound. It is, I want it to be a wall of, of sound. And I guess, I mean, I'm, I think this is kind of probably going to be one of the most unique ways people have ever ran a Class A amplifier. I have never seen anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, the whole thing, you know, I, I, uh, I normally work in Connecticut and mm -hmm. Montreal. So this is my first visit to the new building. Mm -hmm. And uh, I arrived yesterday and wow, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So, um, yeah, really happy to be here and to be associated with uh, uh, with this. It's really terrific. Yeah, and he'll tell you, Dave will tell you that our old building, um, um, it was, I mean, it was quaint. <laughs> but you wish you had demo spaces and and things like that. Yeah, so it, was, it was it was quirky. It was, uh, yeah, it, it was a little bit hard to find your way around. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this place is beautiful and. It, seems to be really functional so exactly uh, i think it's pretty cool exactly so so we keep so it has like an overflow room for like gaming and if you want to go play video games beautiful areas to actually go out and 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 relax and and we can entertain here now we can have large events here but one of the things we really want to work on in this building was we're an audio company and we always tell people that multi-zone um you can do it it's not that complex and we have solutions regardless of the size of your job. And we wanted to actually utilize the building um, as a proving demo. You know, yeah, Class A can drive 60, you know, speakers if you wanted to, kind of madness, or um, the um, the ease of operating a multi-zone system. Yeah, just let me stop you there for a minute. I, uh, I heard a rumor that you did not use Class A amps for all of the amplification. I just want to know why. <laughs> because these guys need them to sell. <laughs> we, we'll talk about that, by the way, as we go along about, you know, people ask me all the time, why do you put Class A everywhere? Well, there's a whole lot of demo rooms here. We have three showrooms, a two-channel room, a theater room, uh, and a variety of other demo spaces. And eventually 
we need to save some inventory for people to actually sell. <laughs> You know, but what, what one thing we, we did do is, like I said, um, we do want to make the demos as impactful as possible. So if you look at, at the space, you'll see um, floating above you, it looks like little black dots. But if I continue to zoom in there, you'll see that they're peppered throughout the building, hanging from the ceiling. And what that is, is we wanted to put in a really nice multi-zone HEO system to really show um, the capabilities of the system. So, you know, like I have about 15 zones in my house and people go, well, how many zones can you really, can you really run? Oh, believe me, I have, I have zones everywhere. I mean, I have them in my, ba I mean, ba bathroom gets a zone, kids room it. gets that's, a zone. That's, that's only 14 more than I have. <laughs> Dave, I know somebody that can take care of you with, yeah. with some, with yeah, some heels with that. <laughs> Yeah, I got you, I got All you. Right. So we wanted to be able to do a really nice, multi-zone system. So what we did was we added 77 of the pendulum speakers and 22 of the subwoofers, the Polk Atrium subwoofers throughout the building being driven by um, a HEO system. And if you look at the system, we have multiple zones throughout the room, throughout the office. So there's ones for sales and marketing and legal and, um, and uh, engineering and design, everybody, even the break rooms have and the cafes have their own multi-zone systems. I, I put in all of these zones, but then I realized that it would be a little easier to group them together. And also, each zone has a keypad or um, that a person can go in and control the, the system. But I had to be careful because you don't want the engineering guys playing the Barney song down in design because they just want to mess with them. So, so, each, so we're working with um, – one of the things that we're doing as well is not only are we using – um, we wanted to stretch the capabilities of HEOs. We wanted to show the ease of control. So we partnered with URC to put in multiple keypads and controllers for all of the spaces to show that um, the reliability of the system and how easy it can be controlled. Could we have used another company like Control 4? Yes, and we looked at all of that. And you may see, um, I'll probably put in a Control 4 system in one of the rooms to show control, but we wanted to just um, give people the experience of trying out all the different products and seeing how Sun United products work with their most popular, whether it's displays, control systems, and things like that. So the multi-zone was fun. Um, six miles of AudioQuest wire. It weighed, we had to go get a van and go, and, um, and it weighed well over a ton. I can tell you six miles is a lot of 500 foot spools. You know, that van was driving like, like, <laughs> like the bottom of it was scraping as we were driving down the street. Um, so the system, like I said, consists of, we chose the Polk atrium, the garden atrium stuff. And for a couple of reasons, um, a lot of times people see this speaker and they think it's solely an outdoor speaker, but it actually sounds really, really good. It has a high quality subwoofer um, and it's a good satellite system, but it's weather resistant. You have the ability to use it. That looks, um, it looks almost like a outdoor light so it has like a pole that you stick in the ground or you can hang them like in a, in a pendulum configuration which is what we did here the subwoofers are normally placed on the ground and the subwoofer is downward firing you can put a plant on top but we flipped them upside down to use the ceiling um, for reinforcement and needless to say that many subs and that many speakers and that many amplifiers sounds really really good and the system runs on a um, as a on a forum load, and but we still have to run a whole lot of wires back to our rack, which is in the classroom. So, like I said, this classroom rack on, powers all of the zones as well as our video, our 16 zone video distribution system. And at the bottom, Dave. Yeah, those, you know, are, those are some good looking amps. So what bottom. are those? Can you yeah, tell about what those are? <laughs> well, unfortunately, they've been discontinued, but they're uh, Class A amplifiers called Sigma Amp 5s. So five channel, uh, five by 200 watt yeah. power amplifiers, very, um, very high performance. They're Class D, so you, you see that they're they're stacked one atop the next. There's no space in between at all. Mm -hmm. um, the only heat sinking required is just the metal in the chassis. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they uh, they sound great and they're super reliable. Yeah, and and I noticed that any run any run really cool. The other thing that you'll see in the rack is um, originally it had a lot more. It seemed like amplifiers, a lot more real estate was taken to drive all the speakers in the building. So by using those the, the class A stuff to drive the really challenging zones, 
Um, we also added, if you look, there's three of the new Bowers CDA 16s in here. Yeah, those so, are cool. Very beautiful design, too, I think. Yeah. They, look, they just look great, I think. So, uh, so we'll make sure that Johanna Derrick will make sure that I'm not incorrect. But it is a 50-watt 50, 50, uh, by 16 into an 8-ohm load, and it'll do, um, into a 4-ohm load, it'll do up to 100 watts per channel. What I like about these is they're only literally one rack mount. So um, by, by combining... One um, rack space. One yeah. rack space. Yeah. So one rack space, if you don't know, is... Um, quite slim that's about as slim as yeah. you're going to get One into a record. quarter inches yeah yeah so a system like this i think johan has a system similar to this to in his house don't you johan i can even say better the picture you're watching is my rack <laughs> <laughs> so during COVID, we had to make photos of this new amp and uh yeah of course everything was closed up and uh, with uh, the protection we needed we took, took photos of my rack uh, and we use it now for uh, yeah, the manual and stuff like that. So yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. 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 We have a rough job. We have we have a very very rough job. And and what's nice about this rack, if you look about, if you look at it, you have a um, a Heels Super Drive, which is four zones, um, as well as the receiver has its own Heels module. So you're already looking at five independent zones there, but you have um, uh, 16, 32 channels of amplification, not counting the AVR. And we've learned that most people, even if you have the biggest house in the world, there's probably going to be like four or five people, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm listening to different things. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this really, really helped by adding those three, um, three of these in our rack. That was, I can't even do the math on that, 48 channels immediately right there. And it really simplified the rack. It made the rack a lot um, slimmer. It made everything more compact. But I think these are great. I mean, a Heels Superlink with one of these Bowers amplifiers, or a couple of them, is a is is a wonder. Um, is a is a great, great, great solution. Yeah, very cool. So, so, so I know that was I keep forgetting that was your rack, man. Nice wire, nice management there, Johan. <laughs> the detail, the detail on the Marantz uh, processor. Uh, and you see how much detail I put into this. Uh, how are you utilizing all of these zones in your home? I'm kind of curious. Um, I must honestly say I only use uh, one uh, at my home. My home is, isn't yeah. that big, so this was only for for the <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> So yeah, I use the uh, the hail system uh, to control uh, to my uh, home, so all the war zones are uh, mm -hmm. uh, then bridged with the CDA 16. So you can also bridge, um, um, yeah, the channels if you like uh, to get more power out of it. So that's uh, what I'm doing here. Well, I'm, I'm a I'm a big fan of these. I think that they, like I said, they simplified the system dramatically. And actually, let me get rid of that. Nobody. So, Johan, can you explain that to me? Did you did you just say you're bridging? Yeah, yeah. So you can bridge. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's a 16 channel uh, um, uh, amp, which per two channels, maybe you can bridge. Uh, um, yeah, the uh, the channels. So you can also make it a powerful eight channel amp. So four zone amp in this uh, this case. And you can determine that per, yeah, per two channels, let's say. But yeah, normally, uh, uh, if you do a stereo zone, let's say you uh, you bridge four channels into uh, into two, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing too is the um, it has the ability to do global. So say you have um, uh, you want one of the of the four zones in that superlink to power a large space. Um, that are using multiple channels of amplification, you can set it to global, and that one you don't have because before the old solution, I was using you know um, RCA splitters and everything else to try to get you know four zones or five five areas or or eight channels driving being driven off of one of the zones, and by use being able to put it in global, that allowed me to do that. So a really large space like engineering and design, I have it switched to global, and it's just using one zone on the um on the on the on the uh super drive so it worked really yeah cool. yeah that's super very handy so input eight is the global input and you can link to that uh, input so um then you can uh, yeah, do it with one yeah let's say hails link or something to drive one yeah big room that can be an office but also a restaurant or mm -hmm. pub what, what you like yeah. yeah, and I see, I can see these being used a lot in, like I said, um, small, res, um, larger residential, 
um, commercial, small commercial restaurants, um, things like that. I can totally see it being utilized a lot. And um, and like I said, the amount of zones that are in this rack, and I still have a tons of space left to add additional um, zones if I wanted to. Um, just shows you um, the benefit of this because this used to take a lot more amplifier space before to do this. And in also in that rack is a 16 zone video distribution system. A little later, by the way, we are going to um, talk about that video distribution um, system. We have four webinars planned right now, four, but we have some other people coming to talk in detail, because I know every time I do one of these things, someone has a question about HDMI. So I'm gonna have my, my buddy Matt Murray from AV Pro Edge come and talk about um, long distance HDMI solutions. And this was another way of proving it, whether it's fiber, whether it's HD base T, whether it's video over IP, but this is 16, um, 16 sources, 16 zones. Right now we're slumming it with only like four or five zones and we're not even pushing this to the full limit. So we're gonna have them come and talk about these types of solutions as well. So as you can see, um, we wanted to make a fun and engaging um, entertainment experience. Throughout the building, we have a variety of listing rooms. We have a couple of small showrooms, which we'll show you later. And then we have kind of two premier spaces, one being the room that we're in right now, which is our two channel room, which, um, which we have been working on to put together. So a couple things about the room. First, let's build the room, the hardscape, what the, what the shell of the room, then we'll determine what we're gonna put in the room. So this room is a room within a room. It's got floating walls, it's isolated. The floor is floating, the ceiling is, is a drop it with a, that with, and it has some, um, an air gap until we get to the roof above. It has its own ventilation system. It has its own 50 amp um, electrical, um, all dedicated to it. So we wanted to build a good empty shell. Then, to start. yeah, get, then we have to determine what we're gonna put in it. And Dave, what did we decide to put in it? As you can see. Uh, we've got class A Delta stereos and uh, a class A Delta pre mm -hmm. fed by um, uh, an SACD, Marantz SACD source. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it a, a, uh, a little Denon, Denon uh, for streaming. Yeah, a little Denon for streaming right. um, display. Uh, the loudspeakers are B&W 800 D3s. Um, the thing that's, I think, special about this setup is that we have one stereo amplifier driving each loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's configured in what we call a power by amplification mm -hmm. um, uh, scenario. And I think of it as the Abbey Road configuration. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different than Abbey Road. Abbey Road uses two mono amps per speaker, mm -hmm. uh, which of course I like better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's four amplifiers, but it's four you know big mono amps. So mm -hmm. it's really a, a no compromise uh, mm -hmm. solution. But um, if you don't really have the budget for four, for four amplifier chassis, mm -hmm. you can get kind of close to that, mm -hmm. very close to that really with the stereo amps. And the reason, two things, one is you have one stereo amp for each speaker, which mm -hmm. means that the left channel signals mm -hmm. are contained within this one amplifier and the right channel signals are contained mm -hmm. within the other one. Mm -hmm. So it's it's basically like you do have the benefits of m mono amplifiers. They mm -hmm. can be short speaker cable runs and complete isolation between the left and right channels. Mm -hmm. The other thing then is because you've got a stereo amplifier, you do have two channels available. You use one to drive the woofers mm -hmm. and the other to drive the mid-range and tweeter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you get um, a complete separation of those mm -hmm. functions. Mm -hmm. um, so you get very close to, what again, what I call the Abbey Road solution mm -hmm. uh, or, or configuration, um, but you do it at a, at a uh, you know, a lower price. Mm -hmm. So very cool, uh, very cool setup. Yeah, I like it a lot. And and you'll see a lot that um that this combination of um uh Bowers and and Class A. They they're they're like peanut butter and jelly. They <laughs> um a lot of times you'll see that they're they kind of um well we got we do we do have a long history together. You mm -hmm. know, I I joined Class A in 2002 and I was actually recruited at that time by the chairman of Bowers and Wilkins. So <laughs> so you go back to 2002 and the companies were very closely aligned mm -hmm. um, uh, Class A had become part of the B and W group. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, Class A was purchased by Bowers and Wilkins, and that um, relationship existed until the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. At which point, um, we were acquired by Sound United. Mm -hmm. um, there was a change of ownership at mm -hmm. Bowers and Wilkins, mm -hmm. and 
lot of <laughs> a lot of history we we don't need to go into. But but for many many years, mm -hmm. um, Class A and Bowers and Wilkins have been used together. Yeah, and um, and you'll see that a lot. Um, um, and and like I said, like you like you brought up the Abbey Road thing that you'll like um you'll like this is an older picture of the older Abbey Road system. Um, now it's all been upgraded to, yeah, the, so to the latest these generation. Are, these are CAM or CAM 400, so they're 400 watt mono amps, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they were the original Delta series amps. You can see there are two amplifiers per speaker, so that's what what I call the, the Abbey Road configuration. Mm -hmm. You can tell that they're the older amps because uh, if you look on the on the sides. Um, the back half of the sides, you have external heat sinks, mm -hmm. and the generations that followed this all had active cooling, okay. so uh, you don't see external heat sinks on the newer amps. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's how it all started, and uh, you'll you'll find Class A and Bowers used together in recording studios around the world, mm -hmm. and um, and historically in listening environments associated with Sound mm -hmm. United that go back yeah. decades. Yeah, exactly, and we and we. As we look at this space, to determine what we're going to put in the space, we were like, okay, what what should we bring? And the original thing was first thing that came to my head was Nautilus <laughs> with, and then I was like, oh, we'll get Nautilus. And then they were, I was like, how many amplifiers do we need? And Eric and Derek were like, I think eight. <laughs> and we were like, well, well, yeah, what? you need you need eight channels, which is why this is I always call this my favorite speaker. You need, you need eight channels of amplification. The um, uh, the speaker is a is a is now becoming a pretty old design, but mm -hmm. it's it's totally a classic design. Mm -hmm. um, the if you ask the engineers in in uh, England about this, they would say, well, you know, they would talk about the how the driver technology mm -hmm. is very old compared to what you can buy in an 800 series speaker today. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things about it that are um, uh, to this day contributors to very high performance. Mm -hmm. So for example, they introduced uh, with this speaker the what we call the tapered tube. So if you look behind the tweeter and the upper mid-range and the lower mid-range mm -hmm. and even the woofer, you have a, a tapered tube. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because just as much sound comes out off the back of the driver mm -hmm. as comes off the front of it. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of having that, that sound um, bounce around inside of a cabinet mm -hmm. and hit the back of the driver and cause mm -hmm. distortion. If you can uh, dissipate that, just basically turn it into heat mm -hmm. um, and give it no path to come back, mm -hmm. um, you get a very pure sound. Mm -hmm. It also creates this little, um, no, there's no diffraction, like the sound of your voice mm -hmm. changes when you have a cabinet yeah. next to versus no cabinet. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, having the driver at the end of the tube mm -hmm. was a very um, <clears throat> important part of the design, mm -hmm. which is carried through, th those elements are carried through to the new designs today. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the woofer also has a tapered tube. And the problem, of course, is that for that low frequency, if you were to if you were to put a, a tapered tube like the other drivers have, it'd be 14 feet long. Mm -hmm. So that's you know it's quite a quite a lot of uh, floor space. Yeah. Uh, and so what they did was they rolled it up, um, mm -hmm. and that gave it the look of a snail shell or mm -hmm. or, or nautilus, and mm -hmm. that's how the speaker got its name. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the the thing about this design that um, that makes it really uh, very special is that it is um, actively quad amplified. Mm -hmm. um, people talk about bi-amplifying and mm -hmm. that just means two amplifier channels driving the speaker. Mm -hmm. And there are two ways to do it. You can have it passive or active. Mm -hmm. Passive is the way that we've done it here mm -hmm. where you have a passive crossover inside the cabinet of the loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. And so the amplifier hooks up, the output of the amp hooks up to that crossover. Now the crossover parts that you buy, they have to be capable of handling mm -hmm. hundreds of watts or mm -hmm. thousands of watts. They're lots and lots of power. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a bit higher distortion parts. Mm -hmm. And um, they also require that the amp um, uh, drive energy through the crossover mm -hmm. and it, that energy gets dissipated mm -hmm. as heat. If you can do that function of dividing up the the sound for you know low frequencies go to this unit and mid frequencies go to that unit um, and high frequencies go to the tweeter, if you can do that job of dividing up the frequencies before the amp instead of after the amp, mm -hmm. you can use these very high performance, just like a preamplifier, really low distortion, very high quality parts, and you have nothing between the output of the amplifier and the driver that mm -hmm. it's driving. Mm -hmm. So that means you've got an amplifier that just hooks right up to the woofer mm -hmm. and you've got another amplifier channel that hooks right up to the lower mid-range mm -hmm. 
one for the upper mid range, one for the tweeter. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a very high degree of purity mm -hmm. in that scenario. Mm -hmm. It's it's insanely expensive <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do it at this level, right? And it takes a lot of space. You can see that. Um, yeah. I think this is a kind of a temporary scenario, but uh -huh. you can see that um, the that uh, uh, a lot of amplifier channels mm -hmm. are required to make this all happen. So you have here six mono amps and a stereo amp uh -huh. to get eight channels of amplification. Yeah. But um, but even though it's a, I don't know, it must be going on 30 year old design. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Johan could comment on that. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but it's an older design. But wow, does it sound really good? Yeah. And we thought about it because Eric said, "Let's do this." And then you guys, and then we were like, and I was like, "How many amps?" And they were like, "Well, I think." You know, we need you know eight, eight monos, monos. <laughs> or or maybe you can get by with four stereo. You can get by with maybe four stereos. And I looked at it and I was like, that'll be great, but the size of the rack and everything else, we wanted to have the ability to um to to move stuff around, and we wanted to kind of show the latest in um um Bauer's technologies, and that's found the latest driver technologies are found in the in the in the speakers behind you. Yeah, the 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 current 800 series is. Um, considerably more advanced mm -hmm. than what was available when the Nautilus was designed. Exactly. And uh, it's also, you know, it's half the price of a Nautilus mm -hmm. uh, to get an 800 D3. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the performance you get at half the price, mm -hmm. uh, the 800 D3 is off the charts, great value. Mm -hmm. you, you, you tend not to think of great value yeah. when you talk about a $30,000 repair loudspeaker, yeah. but um, you can't get anything anywhere close mm -hmm. um, uh, that that, from another brand uh, at that at yeah. that price, especially and also if you just look at the fit and finish, you can see when you beautiful. when you put your hand Absolutely on it, beautiful. you look yeah, at these it, are these are <clears throat> uh, lacquer finish, mm -hmm. um, it's piano black lacquer finish, which is all done by hand and you know many I don't know how many coats thirteen coats again. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Derek, Bowers, Derek and uh, Johan yeah, are going to be quizzing you at to, the end of this yeah, thing. It's a lot of coats <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's super shiny and beautiful. And uh, yeah, it's it's absolutely spectacular yeah. finish. So it's yeah. a it's a piece of art that's in your room. Mm -hmm. You know, some people buy the Nautilus, mm -hmm. um, not because they intend to listen so much as they just think it's a it's fantastic a beautiful, piece, piece of art. Yeah. So uh, I think you'll see with Bowers and Wilkins over the generations mm -hmm. that there's been an attention to industrial design mm -hmm. and a kind of a form follows function. Mm -hmm. Uh, aesthetic mm -hmm. and it's uh it's a really i think beautiful product yeah the other thing too was if you notice like also sitting in this room is a pair of polk l800 legends which are also a very good speaker um it's a different price point yeah, yeah um, different, different characteristics yeah, yeah. different benefits we wanted to be able to show both of these and before i was running around and and to do a demo i would have to uh, it, it was it was all being driven off of the delta stereos and we were I was running around and unplugging and plugging in. So I'm not intimidated. I don't think you are either. I'm swapping wires, but a lot of people who want to come and use the room were, were a little intimidated by that. So what we did was we brought, we put in a second rack on the opposite side of the room, the one that you'll see in this picture in silver, which I'm gonna actually put a TD-15 Marantz turntable on and a Model 30. When you compare the, the price of the speaker to the price of the amplifier, those are pretty much aligned just like the price of the Class A um, amplification and preamp to the Bauer. So it's kind of, it kind of shows you a combination that you would actually use. Um, even this system is um, um, sounds absolutely amazing. We put a Denon Heels piece over there. I'm probably gonna swap it for Marantz Heels enabled piece because we wanted to be able to quickly switch between the two, the two systems. So I can literally bring up a song um, on an iPad and and have them both level matched and just mute between the two yeah, and awesome. you could a b systems so it was a quick way and it's actually cleaner to a b that way than using a a speaker switcher because that actually um will add noise and could actually uh, interfere yeah, right, with the right. overall performance so it's actually right. a better way of doing it and high res now we have these super audio cd players um, in both systems but most of the time people aren't using those anymore yeah, I don't. Um, I don't use physical media anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, uh, if I do buy discs, I will rip them and and put them into mm -hmm. um, uh, storage mm -hmm. so that I can call them as digital files. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the last year, you know, last year was a very strange year, of course. Mm -hmm. But I would say that I I I've listened almost equally to um, open reel tape, mm -hmm. um, vinyl records, mm -hmm. and um, digital media mm -hmm. typically streamed mm -hmm. or streamed either from mm -hmm. a service like Cobuzz or Tidal, mm -hmm. Rune, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. um, or uh, from the network uh, uh, from things that I own and mm -hmm. have local. Yeah, because it seems like in some regions, um, physical media, like the disc, is still super popular. Super popular, yeah. If, you know, Japan is still very big with SACD in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, and in some places in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they're still using a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of discs, mm -hmm. which is fine. It's they are they are starting to get a little bit harder to mm -hmm. find, um, and often new artists are selling single mm -hmm. um, uh, tracks, tracks mm -hmm. on a digital file, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like it's a complete album. It's just here's a track. Yeah. Um, and if you if you like that stuff, then then that's the way you buy it and, and listen. Yeah, and one of the things that I've that I've noticed too is, um, like I said, you used to have to sacrifice performance for convenience, and now the it's ones and zeros. So the same ones and zeros that were on the physical disc, whether it's um, CD level or Super Audio CD level or or what um, is now available as a as a from from a, from a as a digital download. Yeah, when you when you play a physical disc. Um, and you're listening to it in real time, mm -hmm. and uh, they have very sophisticated error correction systems mm -hmm. that that make up for um, wrong or missing data. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're ripping a disk mm -hmm. to um, a computer or to a NAS drive mm -hmm. or something like that, um, it's a little bit different because the um, the the computer, let's say, that's ripping it mm -hmm. has a chance to read the same data multiple mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. to minimize the chance that it's going to get anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So you have the smallest amount of errors. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, uh, when you play it back, um, we have control of the clock. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the level of jitter can be lower mm -hmm. than it is over an SP diff mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. There are just some technical reasons why mm -hmm. it can be better if you play from a file instead of a physical yeah. disc. Yeah, the other thing too that we want to stress is while, while we're using Heos to run this entire building and you could do everything from you know Pandora or Tidal or Spotify, um, Heos can also, also support high res, um, DSD, double DSD, 192, 24, PCM, all that type of stuff. So if you have a, um, in this room, we're going to have a large hard drive full of files. So we're not gonna be pulling a lot of streaming stuff. We can, if someone wants to immediately find, there's a song that they want from, I don't know, Lionel Richie that we don't have in our catalog, they can go to it and find at least a CD quality version of it online and get a great um, um, presentation, right. or um, they can go right to our hard our hard drive catalog and um, and get it from there. So when we talk about Heos, people a lot of times just think about the streaming aspect of it, but if you have a large collection of digital files uh, in your home on a network somewhere, you can do that. And in fact, because this whole building is connected, even this hard drive full of music here, I can grab a song here and play it throughout the entire building if I if I so choose to. Yeah, so HEO serves as the media player function. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Delta Pre, for example, mm -hmm. the Delta Pre is a renderer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have media player functionality. Mm -hmm. So in the future, we want to be able to do an upgrade where we change out the network module mm -hmm. for a HEOS module, mm -hmm. which will give us that media player capability as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll just add to its capability. Yeah. It's a little ways down the road, but we're working on it. Yeah. That. And there's one more thing, too, that's kind of neat about a digital download, whether you're looking at a video download or a music download, is a disc has a finite amount of space. And if the artist wants to put 12 songs on there, there's the, 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 the space that's there is a space limitation. So that means the amount of resolution will have to go down as the length of the content increases. When you have a download, it is the file is the size of the file. There is no limitation on it. It just takes a little longer to download it. So um, a lot of times, like we, all of our video systems are that we use, we have 4K Blu-ray players, which are great, but we most of our demos are done with a Kaleidoscape because the if I'm having a if it's a two and a half hour movie or the Justice League, which is like I don't know how many hours that sucker was. Um, there's no way you can get that on a on a single disc without some sort of without having to drop the amount of the bit rate. And if it's a digital download, you just end up with a bigger file and the and the kaleidoscapes do not matter. And that's the same thing with this. If it's a long album, you know, or you know, you're not limited by the physical media itself. Yeah. Well, that's that's where the artists do have a, a more freedom today than than they did when they were limited by mm -hmm. physical media. It used to be 
that you were limited by the um, the uh, the size of the album. Mm -hmm. And um, the more music you were trying to fit on that album, the more compressed it had to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and when we got to CD, it mm -hmm. freed everybody to have full resolution for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, it's it's the artists are, are freed from even the limitation, which it's a minor limitation, mm -hmm. but they're they're free to, to make mm -hmm. something as long as they want it to yeah. be. Yeah. So in this room, we decided in this room we wanted to have um, our um, uh, a representation of the highest, most the uh, our one of our our best speaker that utilizes its late the latest technology, which is the, a pair of 800 series. So we decided to do that, and of course the driver pair 800 series, like like um, like peanut butter and jelly, the class A is the best solution for that. It's yeah, the they you, work well together. Yeah, not only do they work well together, of all the speakers and amp combinations there mm -hmm. are in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this among all of them, I would say, is the the, the pinnacle of uh, ex a pinnacle example mm -hmm. of uh, products that were literally made for mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. So when we conceived the Class A amplifiers, mm -hmm. our idea was we want them to be the perfect amp for the new 800 series mm -hmm. loudspeaker, mm -hmm. and um, that meant that they had to have certain capabilities with respect to delivering current mm -hmm. and a lower impedance mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, and then the um, engineering prototypes mm -hmm. were used in choosing the final mm -hmm. crossover components mm -hmm. which determine the voice or this you know the ultimate mm -hmm. refinement of the speaker mm -hmm. um, so it, it was a little kind of an iterative approach mm -hmm. where each product was mm -hmm. tuned so that they they work really ideally together mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. yeah the other thing too is while we're using um, uh, class A with the 800 series um, our other products, whether you have a, a Marantz or a Denon product, we have a very close relationship with Bowers for years as well. It now are they going to have the same capability as this? You know, this is the no nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but they do sound really good. So if you have an ability, if you ever have the opportunity to go to our um, our listening facilities for and and look inside of the. Um, the, the 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 listening rooms that are in our Shirakawa facilities, our our sound masters um, are familiar with this particular speaker. You'll um, we have a very close relationship with Bowers um, for many many years. We always say once we were friends and now we're family. Yeah. So so we respect the brand and um, we and and we can uh, and it's kind of um, um if you can drive a pair of Bowers well, you can drive anything well. Yeah. So well, and you know the thing is too that that um, I don't want to imply that the Bauer speaker has to be driven by mm -hmm. a Class A or a Marantz mm -hmm. amp, mm -hmm. or that a uh, Class A or a Marantz amp only works well with Bowers, mm -hmm. uh, or Denon uh, only works well with Bowers, because mm -hmm. that's not that's not true at all. When mm -hmm. when you know we have good engineers doing um, the development of these products, mm -hmm. and um, we feel that they sound. Um, like we want them to sound mm -hmm. when they're used together, mm -hmm. but um, a great loudspeaker is a great loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. And if you put different amplifiers in front of it, mm -hmm. you'll hear what those amps sound like. Mm -hmm. And you may like the combination of a Bowers with a different amplifier. Mm -hmm. You may like the combination of the Class A amplifier with a different loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's always ultimately why you've got so many choices mm -hmm. of speakers and amps. Mm -hmm. But um, the two used together do actually yeah. sound the yeah. way we want them to sound. Exactly, but it's just a flagship speaker with our flagship amplification. So it's, um, the other thing too is we have, uh, as you can see the, from these pictures, we have um, a variety of different demo rooms and you'll see these combinations. I think Eric is taking this demo room down right now, but um, but we have a variety of combinations where you will see the, these options throughout the world. So whether you're, you come to um, San Diego or you go to one of our facility, other facilities, you'll, you'll have the ability to experience, to experience this. Now, if you look at these other rooms, they really are really really pretty. I mean, they're they have all their room treatments in. Um, everything is all laid out. Um, you'll see that these rooms are really really well laid out. We built the shell <laughs> first. I will let you know this is not the final cosmetics in the room. These are just um, solutions that we had to to make it sound good temporarily until we could make it pretty, because not everybody has the ability. To, to have a, a, a custom built room. In right. fact, Dave, you deal with a lot of spaces um, that yeah. are not 
that that are just ballrooms and ideal. hotel rooms. Yeah. So so what's what are some tips that you do to um to make those rooms sound a little better? Well, I think the first uh, the first thing is to accept that um, not all rooms are going to be perfect or easy. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to focus on a few things to try to get a, a good result. Mm -hmm. um, three things really I focus on. One is I try to um, minimize the effect of first reflections. Mm -hmm especially if a sidewall, mm -hmm. um, which is typically the, 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 the surface that gives mm -hmm. you the earliest first mm -hmm. reflection, um, if, uh, if there's a sidewall that's problematic, you wanna be able to get something against that sidewall mm -hmm. at the point of the first reflection mm -hmm. because you don't want the reflected sound to arrive in close proximity to the direct sound mm -hmm. because your, your brain doesn't really sort those out very well. Mm -hmm. If it arrives at some later time, mm -hmm. your brain can very easily mm -hmm. um, um, separate them mm -hmm. and you really hear um, the direct sound mm -hmm. a bit more as, as expected. So anyway, try to um, uh, uh, try to control either with um, uh, absorption or diffusion. Usually mm -hmm. in a smaller hotel room, mm -hmm. you're dealing with absorption, just trying to to mm -hmm. control it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that you can determine where the first reflection is, is just put a mirror along the wall. If you mm -hmm. have a little hand mirror mm -hmm. that you can use and just slide it along the wall with someone lit list uh, sitting in the listening position, mm -hmm. um, recognize that there really is only one ideal listening position. Mm -hmm. So so put somebody there, move the mirror along the wall until they can see the speaker, mm -hmm. and that's where the first reflection is, mm -hmm. and just deal with that area. Mm -hmm. A second thing is getting the bass response to be mm -hmm. uh, correct, and uh, that involves moving the speaker fore and aft um, closer and further from the sidewall, mm -hmm. um, moving the listening position uh, forward and backward a bit, mm -hmm. And what you're what you're going for is just the smoothest bass response, um, having it blend well mm -hmm. with with the higher frequencies. And then lastly, I'm a stickler for having um, very high degree of symmetry. So I have a uh, laser uh, measuring device mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I use to make sure that the um, the speakers are exactly the same distance from the back walls and hopefully the side walls as mm -hmm. well. And then that, um, especially they're the same distance from the listener. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have an isosceles triangle and uh, somewhere from between equilateral and isosceles. Mm -hmm. And you have um, a very high degree of precision in the distance from yeah. the listener to the speaker. Yeah, because timing is a big is a big part of stereo. The, re the way our ears work is, Frequency and um, frequency phase and timing gives you direction. Um, the the from high to low, the room tells you that it's Doppler. It tells you that it's coming. It's going by you. Yep. You know the yep. t um, the time it arrives to your ears and the phase that tells you where it's located. So if you're slightly off with that with that symmetry, it can shift the um, where you perceive objects to be. There's also um, I think a big factor. Uh, for a lot of us who are uh, a little bit OCD uh -huh. as audiophiles is um, psychoacoustics. Mm -hmm. If um, if a, if the if the speakers, if you can detect by just looking at them mm -hmm. that one is towed in a little bit mm -hmm. more than the other, mm -hmm. or you know, if you can tell that there's some difference uh -huh. in the in the alignment. Mm -hmm you just won't be able to relax and, uh, <laughs> and enjoy it. So having everything be perfectly aligned yeah. um, gives you a, a good feeling that it's, that, it's, uh, that it's set up properly. Yes, so along the way, we're gonna actually, um, um, as these sessions go along, we're getting all of the acoustic treatments for this space. So you'll get, you're gonna meet, um, John Calder's gonna come from Acoustic Geometry, and we're having this full room treated, as well as the theater. Right now, we're using temporary pieces. These pieces that we use, like Dave talked about, um, when, you go to, when you go someplace to a trade show, you wanna, you wanna help eliminate those first reflections. These are freestanding pieces from a company called Snow Sound that we take to trade shows. So I can put, you know, one over, I can find those first reflections in, in, um, in, a, in a hotel room or a conference room and utilize these to kind of tamp down some of that stuff and make it Yeah, sound there are also better. reflections off the rear wall that people don't uh, mm -hmm. often consider. Mm -hmm. So the, that's, a, that's an important thing to control the, mm -hmm. the sound of the rear wall, which mm -hmm. is why this is, these are where they are. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll see throughout the rest of the real, um, room we have that. Now, a little later, we have a whole session about acoustic room treatments. But the, but the main thing is you can treat a room temporarily 
to get good sound from that space until you can make it really big and really pretty. And a little later we'll show you after we talk about the theater, um, what are some of the things we're gonna be adding to this space um, because this room sounds pretty good, but the cosmetics, <laughs> my, the, the design committee wants it to be design really pretty. Design yeah. committee would not be <laughs> exactly satisfied. Yeah, so they want it to be a little bit more elaborate, but but we want a nice system that we have a like a nice um, $15,000 Marantz um, poke system, which sounds better than what most people have ever heard. And then we have the step up to show people, because the whole goal of having a nicer space is to show people that there's a difference as you move up. You or your customers or can determine if they want to spend the additional premium for that additional a bit of performance, but we want to be able to show people that there is that difference. And once you realize that there is a difference as you spend more, um, you're more willing to invest, especially if you're a music lover. Yeah, I think people who are just discovering audio uh, tend to think that if you spend more, it plays louder. Mm -hmm. And that may be the case, but that's not the purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you're spending more, it should play more effortlessly. It mm -hmm. should play more accurately, I guess we, yeah. we'll say, but, but it should be just more enjoyable. Yeah. And... Um, uh, once they experience something that maybe they didn't know it, you could have, mm -hmm. uh, it recalibrates their expectation. Mm -hmm. And whatever their budget is, they mm -hmm. may decide, well, yeah, maybe I could afford a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, effort, effortless precision is, is the best way to think about it. One thing that's great about this room, Dave, is um, the meters. I love the meters on, <laughs> on the Class A pieces because if you guys don't know, when the meters are straight up and down, it's about three watts. Yeah, you know yeah, the stereo amp. It's well, it's yeah, two and a half watts yeah. uh, at eight ohms. Exactly. And uh, the mono amps, it's uh, it's only three watts. Yeah. At eight so ohms. when you actually have a, the ability to do a demo for someone, and they are just shocked at the impact and the power that's coming out, and then they see that the 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 meter is barely at three watts, and you tell them, oh yeah, this is if you get the mono blocks, you're looking at you have a thousand watts sitting there, yeah. you know, yeah. um, in reserve. It's just effortless. It's you want it to be you want um, you'll probably never need that much power, but you want to be able to, but you'd rather have your car, um, or you would have a, a car that does 200 miles an hour on a, on a 35 mile an hour freeway is just idling. And that's the same thing with this. It's effortless. And the more effortless it is, the cleaner it's going to be. Yeah. So, so that's well, so what similar to the idea that, that the goal of a high end audio system isn't to play the loudest, mm -hmm. you know, there are commercial sound reinforcement mm -hmm. systems that'll play much louder. Mm -hmm. Um, it's to it's to just play them you know the most beautifully and um, uh, that's what you get with an amplifier like this. This mm -hmm. is not designed to be the most powerful amp in the world. People mm -hmm. get all mixed up on and talking about mm -hmm. how much power an amp has, mm -hmm. and um, it has to have enough power, mm -hmm. and it has to have actually more than enough. It has to have enough that mm -hmm. when it's working at whatever limit you normally would have in mm -hmm. your house, mm -hmm. that there's plenty of reserve. Mm -hmm. But once you have plenty of reserve, then you can focus on all the other things that exactly. make it good. Yeah. So whether we're using the 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 hundred watt per channel model thirty system or the thousand watt the thousand watt per speaker um, system, both systems will play more than enough more than loud enough to fill this room with impactful sound. It's just that one just has a lot more reserve yeah. um, um, uh, sitting there in case you actually need it. Now, um, now, Frederick, do we have any questions? Or, um, before we move on? Um, well, we had a couple of questions that pr pretty much answered life. Uh, there was one from Samuel asking if digital files indeed sound better than physical disks, and there's ways to explain why in most cases the, the physical disks will not play as, uh, or that you have more control if you have digital files, so to speak, because like what Dave mentioned, you have control over the clock, you have even people who have music service with external clock, you, you have music service that use linear power supplies instead of switching power and so on and so on. Um, so Leonidas also was quite happy to hear that there will be a Helios enabled Class A product. <laughs> I'm not sure, Dave, how much you can uh, talk about that. It's uh, um, well, the um, the global chip shortage has um, 
has compromised the speed of development of some of these things, um, unfortunately. But we are working on an update that would, it'll be a physical update, so it will be um, uh, HEOS plus some other capabilities mm -hmm. that we'll add. And um, uh, there will be a charge for that, mm -hmm. and it will come at the same time that the price of the preamp increases. Mm -hmm. So if you buy the preamp today, you could buy the upgrade, let's say a year or so from now, and um, <clears throat> your total investment will be the same as if you waited a year to buy it. So. Yeah. And that's another reason why we didn't do, <laughs> I wanted to do the um, the uh, the full Nautilus thing, and he was, and Dave would have killed me if I had pulled eight, pro, eight amp models out of his inventory, um, let alone we'll talk about the theater and how many, how many, um, um, the the reference, a reference Bowers steered and how many Class A amplifiers are required for that. So we decided to be, do we really need that much to really get a part, to get the point across um, along the way? So, any other questions? At the end of the day, there's a lot of, yeah, I was going to say there's plenty of exciting products on the roadmap mm -hmm. that we can't talk about, but it's it's a very interesting time for Sound United. So um, the next thing that we want to talk about is. The theater, because it's amazing how quickly we can go through time. So um, same thing, I saw the big reference theater just like I saw those Nautiluses, and I was like, oh man, I want those. And just like when you told me, okay, if you do Nautiluses, you gotta have you know eight you know Delta Monos, the thing, yeah. the rack is gonna have, it's gonna have a hold a ton, and you know, and I was like, well, maybe that's a little overkill for this space. So same thing, I saw this CT800 reference theater, and I said, I want that and then they and i and they said great well each one of these speakers has to be um has to be uh buy and 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 they're like again, just like the novel it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing and that's that's active active by amplification mm -hmm. so like we talked about with the nautilus here you have a crossover that sits in front of the amplifier mm -hmm. instead of behind the amp, mm -hmm. so um, the performance is uh, really exceptional, okay. and the you know the dynamics it doesn't chew up any power. It's uh -huh. really awesome. Yeah, yeah. So so this was the original. My original dream was oh I'm gonna put in the full CT800 series, and I had this whole thing all built into my into my head, and then. Um, they were like, well, we want to also put in a, a regular TV because um, we want an AK TV for AK gaming and things like that. So I'm like, okay, so we got to have a screen that motorizes so I can't put the speakers behind it. And then we were like, okay, what's the best impact to get um, a large projection screen, a large display, and to be able to fit all of the electronics in here to power it. And when I, when I saw this and I said, spec this out, Eric McBride, who works for me, who works with me, and he said, oh, you need to... Um, each one needs to be powered by its own amplifier. So, you know, you got six of those. So you need 12 Delta Monos. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's awesome. But where am I going to put, you know, 12 Delta Monos plus the amplifier to drive the subwoofers? So you're looking at probably 16 Delta Monos. That's a lot of space. And I wasn't sure if I needed, if by the time I put the amplifiers in and the speakers in, you wouldn't have any room for seating. So. So I decided to take one step down, which is still, by the way, probably the most outrageous system you've ever seen in your entire life. But but um, but we wanted to take a little bit step down. The cool thing about these Delta Monos, these are the old ones again. Yeah. Um, but but one of the benefits of them being rack mountable is I could have put them all in there if I had the rack space because you could stack them, and because of how they're designed. Yeah, that's they right. Would, you know, when when we um. We had the original, the, the Delta series with mm -hmm. the convection cooling, mm -hmm. and I saw a photograph of a, a very large theater installation that someone had done. Beautiful utility room, marble floor, just spectacular. And um, there were a lot of Class A amplifiers, mm -hmm. but there were also some smaller amps from mm -hmm. another brand. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the customer had to use those other amplifiers was there wasn't physically enough space. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that this customer didn't have enough money, mm -hmm. <laughs> he just didn't have enough space. Mm -hmm. And so with the active cooling solutions, what we were able to do is uh, eliminate the need for putting a gap mm -hmm. between uh, the amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So each amp could sit one mm -hmm. right atop the next. Mm -hmm. And that bought us more rack space. Mm -hmm. So um, you wouldn't have to suffer the indignity of mm -hmm. using um, 
uh, another brand amplifier uh, in your theater <laughs> system. You can do all class A. Okay. So uh, subsequent to that, we really uh, dug into the temperature mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of amplifiers and under began to really clearly understand the benefits of gaining control of the temperature mm -hmm. and how 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 we could tune the amplifier mm -hmm. to an even higher degree mm -hmm. if if the temperature wasn't vary, varying depending on when we're least listening, how hard we're driving mm -hmm. it, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this system here, um, what they used for the, this is one I believe is in the, uh, the in, on the East Coast facility. Yeah. Um, what they were using was the original digital ones, right? There you go. So they were using, um, those are those are CT amplifiers, custom Class A custom theater amps, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so those were the first amps that used active cooling, mm -hmm. and the the solution was so effective that we uh, introduced it into the Delta series, mm -hmm. and it's been there ever since. Mm -hmm. So these were really cool, but maybe one day Dave will make a replacement for these. So the Delta Monos would have been a little, or even Delta Steros Delta would have been Stereo, a little, yeah. a little bigger. So these are their flagships, and they are designed to to fill a gigantic. You could use them in a small room, but it is it is absolute overkill, you know. So um, and they could fill some of the most gigantic spaces you've ever. And we're talking about effortless precision. So what I said was, I want to have a system that could that would work well in my space that would still give you that effortless precision. Now there was the other way, and then I had to choose. I could have went out and bought, and we looked at it. Do we go get, you know, six? or you know six or seven 800 you know d3s um, and that would have been great it would have worked great with subwoofers to go along with each one but they're visible yeah you know when the ct loudspeakers were initially developed mm -hmm. it was in response to the fact that there were people who didn't want to buy the 800 series mm -hmm. and then put them into uh, an enclosure in mm -hmm. the wall mm -hmm because they look so you know they, they look so good they so the ct speaker mm -hmm. was a version that was uh, built into a cabinet that was more utilitarian mm -hmm. very rugged and it was clear that it was designed to be put away and covered with grill cloth yeah. or whatever and uh, yeah so that's how the that's how the concept for the ct came along yeah so there's basically two way three ways we could have done it we could have made them highly visible which is which is this look at my and we've done that at demos and everybody goes in and goes ooh and ah and some customers want that the other way is i can use a in wall and just or um, a more of an architectural design and make them completely disappear and many customers choose that but our biggest challenge is what happens in the future if we want to try a different solution and you build it physically in like this it's a little harder to make those upgrades. These were great. I'm thinking about getting, a, um, hey, Johan, what are the, the the ones that build into the wall with the back boxes? What are the top of the lines? I always forget what that model is. That's why I'm good to have a Bowers guy on the call. Yeah, th this is a, actually at, at IZ, this uh, this picture. And okay. these are the CI 800. So not okay. the, the CT, uh, custom theater, but custom install. Mm -hmm. yeah, Which and allows the you that you have minimum depth. And we built a, a acoustic treated room here um, with minimum depth, of course, because uh, floor space is limited at those shows. Um, and so, yeah, we utilize here the the, the CI 800 Diamond. Mm -hmm. So we call it all, uh, the Diamond Theater uh, in on that show. Exactly. So we have um, your, regular, your 800 series, then you have your CI, which is build it in, hide it forever. What I liked about the CT solution was the fact that I had all of the, the great performance, all of the things you expect. Um, I mean, the better, all of the better stuff you would expect from a, um, a, a Bowers, but it was easier later to retrofit. So um, what these sit behind are gonna be large columns that are removable. So if I wanted to take them out or swap them from something else, I actually could. But I still wanted the system to be effortless. So for each channel, we're using a CT um, 8.2 and a, um, a CSW 15, which, which means each channel can play down to 16. So I hear people say, my speakers are large. Unless you do something crazy like this, most of the time your speakers are not large. They could be helped by um, a sub, most speakers can be helped by a subwoofer, but I want it full range on every single channel. And that was, that was the approach that we took. Each of the CT, each of the 15 inch subwoofers are driven by one of these SA-1000s. So, and um, so you're looking at 
um, all the amplifiers to drive the tops, which I'll show you in a second, and then each of the 15s is driven by this. Plus, we have subwoofers for the um, for the um, the LFA. So right now, I just have the center channel on. Don't tease me about my stand. We're building a new stand to go with it, to go along with all of these things. And the speakers will be in columns, and the entire room will be uh, acoustically treated. But now you can actually just see what's going to be behind all of the acoustic treatment. So you can see um, each channel is pretty darn um, impressive. Um, so that, and uh, so this is kind of the way that what the room looks like right now um, before we build in all of the, before we hide it all from the viewer. And if I want to change the speakers out, all I have to do is move these giant, basically think of them as giant eight foot tall speaker grills and I can move them out of the way and I can swap out um, the audio system. There's 24 channels um, ran for the floor and then there's I think 16 in the ceiling. So the goal was to build a room that we would have That's enough stuff. 40. Yeah, <laughs> that we would have enough <laughs> that we would have enough channels um, around the space that we would that um, hopefully we would never get to that point. And and so you can kind of see the layout we have in there right now. I have a voice of God capability as well, so I can do a DTSX Pro slash um, IMAX Enhance slash Oral 3D configuration, and I can also do a high end. Um, Dolby, um, Dolby Atmos type configuration in this space. This is the system that we decided to start with. Actually, I had a 15-inch subwoofer for the center channel as well, but it made it a little too high to go under the TV, so we decided just to go with a gigantic um, main speaker. The nice thing that I like about these CTA um, 8.2s is they are LCRs. So if you look, the tweeter module for the one that's in the center channel, the tweeter mid-range module, has been, you could relocate that. So when they come out of the box, they look like the regular left and right and surround speakers. And within, what, 10, 15 minutes, we were able to reconfigure it, move the, one, the woofer to the side and, 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 um, and re, um, reorient, reorientate, <laughs> I'm not sure you say that's the right word, These, the, uh, into a center channel configuration. So it really makes it easy to use them in a horizontal or a vertical um, application. So this is the, awesome. uh, the, SUS. the, um, the as you can see, most of these speakers are running in large. Um, the center channel only runs down to 40 before it crosses over to the subwoofers, um, but that's still insanely impressive. Um, the, the subwoofers are just for LFE. Those are the the Bowers DB1Ds, and um, and also any type of bass that would have been sent to the height channels are actually being sent to the um, the subwoofers. So um, it goes back to that effortless precision, like we were talking about in this room. Um, this room is like that. And um, Dave had the opportunity to do a demo. We did a demo for you, Dave, in that space, and we'll um, you guys will see it next week. Um, we'll do do the next one in that space. But the demo is we did uh, Unbroken, I believe. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, well, it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it it drives home the benefit of having full range uh, speakers all around. Mm -hmm. That uh, things can happen behind you, or they can transition mm -hmm. from front to back or back to front, mm -hmm. and uh, and you don't notice it as getting like small or mm -hmm. large because of the fact that it's coming from yeah you know little speakers and the other yeah. thing too is the engineers a lot of times will mix like if there's a gunshot or a cannon shot um you want um while deep bass is omnidirectional mid bass gives you direction because you can feel the pressure hit you so when we're watching something we're watching unbroken which has a fighter plane go by and there's machine guns yeah. so it's it's literally punching you in the back because yeah, there you, are yeah there are lots of um, you can put a low frequency fundamental into a, a woofer, mm -hmm. but there are harmonics, you know, multiples of that frequency mm -hmm. that get well into the directional range. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, so woofers do tend to produce sound at, at a level that is uh, somewhat directional. So yeah, absolutely, you can hear that. Yeah, and and, and it's nice. You it gives it gives you it just adds a level of impact, and um and the system is never. It's never strained, you know, as we, and, and that's what I liked about it. I want a system that could fill this room um, with, you know, 10, 15 people in it um, and play 
uh, a rock for everything from Pink Floyd rock concerts to the wildest over the top action movie and have people walk out of there going um, absolutely wow. This room yeah. is all, the theater room is also a room within a room completely, theoretically it's completely isolated, but it still shakes the entire building, which is pretty, which is kind of a plan. People come and say, what are you playing in there? It's like, so I, I do kind of get a kick out of that as well. Um, in the room um, to power it all, um, the best way to think about this is all of this, all of those amplifiers you see in there would could uh, is normally done by a single AV receiver. So each speaker is biamped. Um, each surround channel is biamped either with a channel from a PM10 or um, to drive the um, CT8 the 8.2s and then a thousand watt um, SA1000 to drive the base that goes along with that particular surround channel. So every channel is biamped. Plus we also have the M80 MM8077s for the heights. So literally people go in there and they're completely intimidated by the space. And I tell them it's, it pretty much operates like a receiver. So if you're comfortable with a Denon receiver or a Marantz receiver, it's the same thing. It's just all of the amplifiers that would be in the little box are now an entire rack of, of equipment. So these are what drive the um, seven CT8.2s. Those are PM10s which are 400 watts per channel. Is that right, Frederick? Um, uh, and uh, they do, and it's, it's absolutely effortless um, um, being driven on an AV8805. Um, um, you can see the lights and the, the green lights are the, um, the amplifiers that are driving the 15 inch subwoofers or 15 inch woofers or bass drivers that are being utilized with each channel and then you can see the other amplifiers below that as, as well. So really cool system in the back of the room. All of this will be pretty much hidden. I'm still debating about putting a door on that rack, but I kind of like having the lights as ambiance behind you as it actually being played. But it's a, it's a, it's a fun maybe system. A, maybe a smoked glass door so yeah. that you can still see it all but yeah. it's muted a little exactly. bit. Exactly. So that may be the way to go as well. Yeah. So this is a really cool system. You guys will see more about it in the future. This is actually the wiring diagram. The system has a Kaleidoscape, a Pioneer 4K Blu-ray player, an Apple TV. Actually, I put a Roku in. I have I just bought a high-end gaming PC with a GTX 90 NVIDIA and GT whatever 9080 graphics card. Um, that we also have in this room. So if you want to go in here and um, rip a video game, you could do so as well. We're using the eight, the Sony's top um, 8K TV, 85 inch 8K. Um, so you can do 8K gaming, 4K 120. And then a JVC has also loaned us uh, for long term their um, 8K E-Shift flagship home theater projector. So so it is a pretty um, impressive um, room. And the goal is to show people, yes, you can do a soundbar. We'll have our little sound room that we'll start off with giving somebody a, um, we'll start off with a TV demo. Then we'll go to a soundbar demo and people go, wow. And then we'll take them in a showroom. We'll do a 5.1, 5.4 and people will go, wow. And then we'll take them in the classroom and do a, a maybe a DT, um, a, a definitive technology, um, bigger BP tower demo and they'll go, wow. And then we'll walk them in that room and they'll just walk out of there glazed over. Just to show people that yes, as you spend more money, um, and as you, if you, depends on how passionate you are about your music and your movies, we have a solution and all of the different, all of the different price ranges. So um, one thing we want to talk about, another benefit of using the multiple subs is every channel has its own subwoofer. And the fact that we have multiple LFE subwoofers is it smooths out the bass because that's one of the biggest challenges we have in these rooms is bass response. So for example, if you look at this drawing right here, the, the blue and the red lines indicate two subwoofers, and you see they have varying um, various peaks and knolls. Um, the green shows how it all kind of sums out, and you can see that by using multiple subwoofers, it helps cancel out those peaks and knolls. So I may actually add two more subwoofers to that space, not because we need those subwoofers, but I just want to make sure that we're, wherever you're sitting in that room, the base is as even as possible. Yeah, we, earlier we talked about how people 
who are just getting into this tend to think that when they spend more money, it plays louder, mm -hmm. which to a degree is true, but it's not the, the point of spending more money. Mm -hmm. um, adding more subwoofers isn't necessarily, it's not so much about getting more bass, it's mm -hmm. about getting smoother bass. Exactly. Smooth, effortless, deep bass. Um, and and you can, even in your own home, um, take a song or something and start playing it. And as you walk around your room, especially something that has kind of a repetitive kind of bass note, you'll notice that certain spots in their room are going to be stronger than others. The goal is to make that whole room be as even, whether you're in the corner of the room, the, right. the so middle of the room. Right, so you have reflections that are combining in various ways, and sometimes mm -hmm. they combine together mm -hmm. and they add mm -hmm. and they make a peak. Mm -hmm. And other times they, w when one's, getting larger, the other's getting smaller, and they cancel mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. So no matter how loud the signal is, it's either two relatively small signals canceling mm -hmm. or two big ones canceling, and you get a dip. Mm -hmm. And so moving, um, adding subwoofers, mm -hmm. that can help to fill in the dip. Mm -hmm. And then you use an e equalizer mm -hmm. to take the, the peak and attenuate that. Exactly, so we, we talk about that um, as well is um, you all first thing is you try to place your speakers in the best way possible. Then you apply room treatments, um, a way try to treat it with the first reflections and the uh, with um, absorption and diffusion, and maybe um, some sort of um, ba um, base absorption technologies. And then the last thing is digital um, compensation, room compensation. If you go in that direction, you'll always end up with the best the best performance um, possible. Um, the the system, like I said, we talked about here. Um, we've already talked about the importance of treating those um, those first reflections. In this room, um, those first reflections are, you know, you have two speakers. Maybe you know, the these two speakers are close enough that I can use one panel to pretty much tackle the first reflection of both that um, the Bowers and the Polk sitting in this room in that one listening position because I only have two speakers. But if you look at one of these big large theaters where you have speakers all the way around you, that gets a lot more complex on how to tackle all of these first reflections. You know, how do you get, you know, and, and how much diffusion do you use? You don't want to use, and how much absorption do you, do you want to use? Isn't it true that, that, that for a home theater room, if, mm -hmm. you're, if you're developing a room that's specifically for theater, kind mm -hmm. of optimized for mm -hmm. theater, that, that it tends to be, more damped, you know, a, a bit deader, mm -hmm. more more absorption than if it's a pure music listening room. I would I could say that I I would see that, and I and I could probably see the benefit of that as well because, like I said, you have so many speakers in the room. By the time you tamp down all of the first reflections, you it is going to be a little um a little more of a deader room. But the sense of space is coming from the mix um, um, instead of the speaker trying to do it. All by itself. If I want it to be big and immersive all the way around you. I just mix it to the to the left surround the yeah. the surrounds and the backs to give it a bigger, yeah. more open yeah. sound. More cowbell. And yeah. More <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so one thing that we've talked about too is how are we going to do the space? So right now in this room, if you look at it, we have just you know you know panels here and there, and it does a good job, but that it's not very good for the design committee. So the design committee wants things to look seamless. So this, we have been working with a company called Acoustic Geometry. Um, John Calder, he's been on many of our calls. Um, he has been, he's working on not only acoustics for the lobby and the cafe and, and all of the other living spaces to make those um, um, nice to listen to music to as you come walk through the building, but he's also helping design the, um, the acoustic treatments for the two channel room as well as the theater room. And one of the things that they said is they wanted it to be an acoustically treated room without it really appearing to be acoustically treated. So they're doing custom seven foot high diffusers and absorption panels. And then they're also doing secondary panels, which are just panels that you, so um, that don't do anything. But the goal is to keep, to give it the wall a smooth um, look. So we're going to kind of do, this is kind of be kind of how this room is going to look. It'll be a different color than this. The design committee got to pick the color, um, as well as even the ceiling tiles are being replaced with custom um, acoustic tiles for the ceiling. And it'll all have this beautiful, seamless look. I'm curious to see what color they picked. I was just, I just introduced the design committee to the designer. To the color? No. no I, I, the theater I did, really? black. I told them it's going to be black. 
There's no, there's no argument. The theater's black. The theater will have the same type of look, but it's going to be a dark gray with black grill. So you have a little bit of contrast, but in, you want the, the image and you want to be immersed in what you're looking at. You don't want the room to call attention to itself. I'm going to record, by the way, um, all of the installation of this so you guys can see not only when the products come, um, when we take this room from, from what you see here, um, you'll see um, until its final um, version, you'll see how we mounted them, where those different diffusers go. John's going to walk us through the whole thing. What's the type of panels we put on the ceiling? So you'll see us take it from a temporary solution for, for an audio room to a permanent dedicated audio room. So that's going to be that's going to be really, really cool. All right. Um, and like I said, there's going to be a variety of different things that are going to be in the room, um, whether it's absorption, diffusion, and then we also have low frequency um, absorption, which we talk about peaks and nulls. The, um, um, one way of controlling some of that stuff is bass tends to gather in the corner and it can impact your bass performance. So we're going to have um, hold um, solutions for that as well. And we're going to walk in. You'll see that whole we'll have a not only the live webinar but we'll also I'll make sure that I'll make little 10 or 15 minute this is what we did this is of what we did this is why we did it um, so you guys will have more information all right so Frederick Frederick do we have any questions oh yes we have plenty of questions we can go on and on and on so I'm just gonna go through the list first question from Chris in your room right there you have both the L800s, and is it 803 or is it 802 that you have there? We have we have 800D3s, um, Bowers, and Polk L800 Legends. So they're both 800s, which is pretty Right, cool. so, exactly. So his question is, do they affect each other when one is not, uh, not being driven? Just being in the room there, that's probably a good question for Dave. Because yeah. technically uh, speaking, they're a speaker, they're just... That's right. I, I would say the answer is yes. So, uh, so if if we wanted to have a setup that was perfect, truly ideal for either speaker, you wouldn't have the other one there. Um, so, in this case, there's a compromise in order to accommodate the ability to easily demo mm -hmm. either speaker mm -hmm. or to do a comparison mm -hmm. between uh, one approach and another approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think in many people's homes, um, they may not have two pairs of speakers, but they face a situation where they have to make a compromise. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's okay to make a compromise if you have to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you just weigh the, the benefits mm -hmm. and uh, make that make that exactly. call. So if someone was gonna come and really wanted to make a really critical decision about whether or not they were gonna buy a pair of 800s, um, the floor is marked and what we would do is take the the um the eight hundreds and we would just either move them back or move them to the side, the the poke so you could actually do that. Um, if they if they really wanted to have that hundred percent experience, looks like Johan's gonna say something. What's up? Yeah yeah yeah. I just talked to Rainer <laughs> Fink, one of our uh, engineers, and he has also a quick fix. He said it's always better to um yeah um put uh, your speakers out of the room if you really want to listen to. Uh, a pair of animals or pair of pork, doesn't matter. But if you short circuit the woofers, so remove your speaker cable, of course, and then short circuit uh, your terminals for your woofers, that helps a lot. It's uh, a uh, it's, it's a good it's a good point, Johan. There are two aspects of compromise associated with having the speakers together. One is the fact that um, the the sound from one speaker will tend to make the other speaker want to mm -hmm. want to work mm -hmm. so the drivers will want to move and create their uh -huh. own sound they're speakers they uh -huh. want they want to create uh -huh. sound uh -huh. and by shorting the speaker connectors at mm -hmm. the back mm -hmm. you're providing an like an electrical break, break. Okay. Um, that keeps those drivers from moving around mm -hmm. so that's that's one aspect and mm -hmm. then the other aspect is the reflection mm -hmm. of sound um, between one cabinet and the other mm -hmm. so best if you don't have any nearby reflections mm -hmm. um, and that's why physically moving them mm -hmm. away from each mm -hmm. other helps so if they stay in the room then yeah shorting mm -hmm. um, shorting the speaker leads mm -hmm. prevents them from singing along mm -hmm. and um, uh, if they 
if they can be mo moved away from each other, you know, so much the better. And a lot of times we will do that for smaller, for um, with smaller speakers, but these two guys are big. So, so, um, so maybe for certain um, listeners who just want to, like when we bring in, um, like if we were going to evaluate a new pair of amplifiers with these speakers, we would move the um, the pokes out of the way. But the goal of this space is to make it really easy for any um, visiting person to come in and experience both of these. And well, and even though this is not a hundred percent optimum, it's still shockingly good, um, better than what most people have experienced in their entire life. So, so a lot of times you want to. We had to balance between that convenience of being of everybody being able to do quick demos versus it being a hundred percent optimized. Okay. Next question. Uh, Suresh uh, from India wanted to find out what we have done in terms of power conditioning because we didn't talk about power conditioning for the building at all okay so that's an important so like said, aspect yeah the um each of the the theater and the um two channel room have their own dedicated 50 amp going in so it's not one thing was um the theater i was worried about you get that many amplifiers in a theater i, I didn't want to pop fuses so i put in a, a, a big one in there and i said if i'm going to do dedicated for that space let's do dedicated for this space um, both systems have their own dedicated ventilation. Um, over on over on this amp over here, we're using a Furman, um, um, and over and then we're waiting for um, um, AudioQuest is going to actually um, uh, um, loan us <laughs> all of the stuff because it's it's by the time you go way off the rocker with with all of the audio quest stuff it gets pretty high so they were there they they want to loan us all of the power conditioning their niagaras and stuff to run to run this space originally i was using dave's um um power conditioner antigon antigon but i wanted to give it yeah. back to him That's so it. he could take it to trade shows and he has the stuff for demos yeah i use that at uh, it's a dr acoustics product which mm -hmm. um uh which I find to work really well with the amplifiers. And in general, for power conditioning, I would say that it's it's not always a benefit, especially with power amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So it's um, one of those things try before you buy. Mm -hmm. But um, in certain cases, it can be a it can be a huge benefit. Yeah. So, yeah. So the Model 30 rack and the PM10 with the with the eventually it's going to be a reel to reel and a turntable with for the um, for the for the class a stack and there's going to be a td15 for the morants those will both have Furman. the theater is um panamax there's a couple of reasons why i did it one um for the distribution and two um cosmetically the way it looks it's it's just pretty when you combine it with the morants i just think it, it it works good it does what it needs to do it protects my equipment and it really blends really great with the Marantz. And, and then in the, the other three sound rooms are Niagara. And I think in the classroom is PS Audio. So we have a lot of partners that wanted to contribute products. And, um, and we're, we're really very thankful for them. Okay, next question from Chris. Uh, for the main spaces, would it not have been better to locate the power amps local? I would say adjacent, right next to the speakers. Would Consequently, much shorter speaker cables because line level signals traverse further with lower degradation. If you look here in the two channel room, the amplifiers are right next to the speakers. In the theater, we just needed to have a universal location because there were so many. You're looking at a total of 7, 11, 13 amplifiers. And we just needed to have a yeah. um, so, a, a single space so for that. So the short answer is yes, it would have been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, like so many things, you you have to make that decision about mm -hmm. the um, what are the compromises and can you live with you know mm -hmm. we're, we're, that space is not so large mm -hmm. that um, that the long speaker cable runs are um, s particularly problematic. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, but yeah, it's best if, if possible to keep the speaker runs short. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're going to put everything in an equipment rack, you will end up with some long speaker runs. Exactly. And and we tried to use good AudioQuest, their their best in wall rated cabling to run to all of those locations. And each, like I said, each uh, speaker is bi amped. So there's a wire running from one of the green lit amplifiers to the 15 at the bottom. And then there's a wire running from the the one channel of one of the PM10s to the 
to the top channel. So so and we tried to keep the the links as um, the best quality and as short as possible. So every all the wiring, all the HDMI cables, all of the power cords, everything is is um, is AudioQuest. Thank you, AudioQuest. Okay, the next question is for Dave from Arun. Why did Class A abandon or discontinue the Class D amplifier range? And I think he's referring to the Sigma series, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when we were acquired by Sound United in 2018, uh, they were looking to Class A to pursue the um, uh, premium range as, as much as possible. And for us, Sigma was uh, overlapping with Marantz, and Marantz also wanted to come up in price a mm -hmm. bit to some higher, uh, more premium products. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Sound United just didn't want us to have too much interference. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's a logical, mm -hmm. I think that's a logical approach. So mm -hmm. they said, look, put your energies toward um, reconstituting a Delta series and maybe even Omega or things above Delta. Mm -hmm. Just just work on the, the, the premium end of the range. So nothing at all wrong with those Class D amps. They are fantastic, mm -hmm. beautiful, great sounding amplifiers. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it didn't fit with the portfolio strategy of Sound United. Omega, I like that. Delta. Possibly, possibly. Yeah. You know, my dad's name was Omega. No way. <laughs> so, so I like that. Yeah. So Delta and Omega. My son's uh, middle name is Apollo. So you know, I'm I'm all about those types <laughs> of the Greek. I'm all about that. Um, yeah. So that was a good question. I've never. Hmm, good question. Any other questions? Uh, yes. There's a couple of interesting questions from Joey. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to an AV8805, uh, it's he's talking about the AKA chips, and we all know what happened with the uh, with the factory. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the thing is, right now, uh, Bill, what what is it you can explain about the transition that we're doing now with uh, the AKM yeah. chips so, so the, towards so other chips? Is that something? How, how far can we go into it? Yeah. Well, well, the best way I can explain it is. When it happened, we have a very good relationship with them. So we bought everything that they had left in inventory. So, and then we, um, the engineers went back and looked at it and said, what would be, as that solution's worked out, what would be a good option, an up the other option? And they had lots and lots of listening tests to pick the right solution or combination to that. I'm, I really off the top of my head cannot remember which one they chose, but I have been in, in the office multiple times when they're doing um, side by side listing tests with the the one that had the AKM versus the new one, and maybe if you had them side by side with the exact same speakers, you could possibly hear a difference between the two. But it's 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 slight. So and 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 then if I had you to pick, some people would pick A and some people would pick B. So I think that if you um, the performance of the system is still going to be great. These in, the the sound masters and the people that build these Marantanin and products are passionate about the performance and and if they have to redo a board, all of the board to make it work right with that new solution to make it sound good, they'll do that. But you don't have to worry yes, about any drop in performance. Exactly. I was going to say the same thing because the sound masters themselves, every particular product that goes through their hands will be tuned to match the specifications of either a Denon product or a Morantz product. And if they replace the chips with an alternative chip set, they will find equally very good chip that mm -hmm. performs the same way. And then they will tune it in such a way that you will again get that typical Denon or typical Morantz sound. So from our side, nothing to worry about. He it's, was wondering uh, about the AV8. Sorry, yes, sorry. Just carry on, Dave. Which is that um, for all of these parts, whether they're D to A converters, sample rate converters, mm -hmm. A to D converters, whatever, um, there are typically anywhere from three to five parts mm -hmm. in the world at any one time mm -hmm. that could all be equally good depending mm -hmm. on how they're implemented. Mm -hmm. And so that's what these guys are talking about mm -hmm. is that you have to just take whatever alternative part and implement it mm -hmm. to optimize its performance, and then you don't really lose anything. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's why that's why it's it's less important when you say which which D to A converter is being used. Mm -hmm. It's more important uh, to listen to it and see how it's implemented. Exactly. Exactly. He had a similar question comparing the AVR, the AV8805 then in this case, with the um, AVX or AVC, depending on what region you is, A110. Mm -hmm. One does DSD 11.2 and the other does not. So it's kind of hard to generalize which AVR and to what point that we will support 11.2 DSD, because 11.2 DSD is merely something you will find into premium high five. Mm -hmm. The two channel, the SACD players, even the anniversary models. The only exception of a AVR that does support DSD 11.2 would have been the anniversary model because we wanted something different to differentiate. Mm -hmm. So, technically speaking, you will not find 11.2 DSD decoding in AVRs typically. Mm -hmm. That's that's the, the profile that we're trying to match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, These guys are deep today. <laughs> yeah, he's he's on fire. <laughs> sure he's on fire. Is a is a JVC 8K projector? Phil mentioned. Is it based on an old input of four of HDMI 2.0, okay, or well, is that the new model let's, let's, with okay. HDMI 2.1? One 2 .1. little quick thing about HDMI 2.1. I have my friend Matt coming, and we're going to talk when we talk about video distribution. We will give you the new an update on 2.1. Um, there, uh, there, that projector, the RS. It's an RS. 3000, which is the equivalent of an NX9. It is an 8K E-Shift. It has a um, a native 4K imager, and by using um, pixel shifting, it can uh, increase its resolution to up to about 8K of perceived on screen. Um, the inputs are only HDMI 2.0A, so it takes the 8K signal, the 4K signal, up converts it to 8K, and then displays it. There's only one um, I have a. I know a little bit about projectors too, by the way. There's only one current projector that's on the market that has a HDMI 2.1 input on it. It is the LG AU810PB. It supports 24 um, gigabits per second. It cannot do 4K 120. It cannot do 8K 60. It's more about higher bandwidth um, and less compression. Um, and but most of the time when you see projectors, the odds of you seeing a native 8K projector with a native 8K input. It's probably going to be slim. It's going to be a long time because um, trying to put that many pixels onto a tiny little imager on a projector is much harder than a TV. I can take two, four 32-inch TVs and make a 64-inch 8K set. If I'm doing it with a projector, I have to put more pixels in that same size panel size, which means a higher pixel density. So the odds of you seeing um, a, a lot of native 8K, um, 8K projectors um, is going to be pretty slow. Uh, maybe a DLP will be first because by using wobulation, they can, instead of it writing um, four pixels, it writes eight pixels. But that'll probably be the first time you'll see it. Geeking out on 8K. <laughs> wobulation? Wobulation. I know. It's kind of wow. funny. Okay. Get out my. Uh, believe me, um, one thing that we're going to do is Sony's loaning me their um, their big projector for the room. It's called the Raptor. It is a um, a 10,000 lumen um, DCI P3, $90,000 projector minus the lens. And I had to get a FDA license to put it into the room because it's so bright that if you look into it, it will blind you. So... So uh, so that's going to be kind of the demo to the demo um, one in there. I got to rope it off when I actually put it in our demo room so the people don't get too close to it. But that's going to be pretty <laughs> – so that's going to be pretty fun. All right. Wow. So like I said, lots of cool things. One of the reasons why you should be subscribing to our Sound United YouTube channel. So when I get something like a $90,000 Sony projector um, and throw it in the theater, you get to see – you get to check out those YouTube videos as, as well. So any other questions, Frederick, before we let these guys go? Because I know Dave has um, actually has a job to do today. <laughs> yes, uh, we can end with a quick one that was addressed to me from Dewey as well. He wanted to know behind me those acoustic panels. What is that and what kind of material it is? So this is something I sourced from Ukraine, believe it or not. Uh, it's a company that makes these. It's made in wood. Uh, it's uh, some sort of, uh, it's a dense type of foam that's tuned to match the resonance that was trying to filter. So 
I've got two sets. There's uh, one uh, above and below. So there's, two, there's four together that are behind the 802 speakers. Mm -hmm. And what you don't see is behind the 802 speakers on the floor, I also put bass traps mm -hmm. because it's too much of a resonance. You know, apartments in Hong Kong are quite resonant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all concrete and the, the, you have awkward sizes with a lot of standing waves. So that's what I pretty much did. So it's wood. It's a wood. Uh, it's a hybrid panel. It's a, a hybrid between an absorber and a reflector, or so absorber slash diffuser, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's matched the the frequency which I measured as a peak in order to take that one out. And I've got on the opposite side on the back uh, of this room where I have the sofa. I also in that particular corner have a bass trap that. Uh, traps the bass and that uh, reflects the standing waves. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. And you can also Different see Different ways to, to mitigate certain uh, problems. His AV rig gear is pretty nice. I actually had, in the US, uh, we had had some KI rubies that had, that were designed for Japanese voltages. And I could not use them. I was just going to put them on a pedestal because they were so pretty. And Frederick was like, I'll take those. <laughs> so Absolutely. I, uh, I shipped them over to him, and that is what he's using now to drive his his um his um Bauer circuit. And it, it is a it is a pretty looking system behind you. It looks like you're in a showroom, and that is like literally your living room. <laughs> it's it sounds amazing. I am super chuffed. I'm very very happy to have these. They're actually cosmetic samples that were used for uh, making pictures in Europe. So it's a European version because the Ki Ruby. Is not sold in Japan. Okay. It's okay. the SA12 and the PM12. Okay. So this is the cosmetic version, and for some reason they had Japanese power modules in them. Uh -huh. So which is not an issue because we use power converters anyway. So but uh -huh. sounds amazing. I'm very happy. Yes. So so we wanted. So it's been a fun. It's been fun. So as you can see, it's it's great to hang out with you guys, and I am looking forward to doing more of these. So I'd like to thank Dave. For, for spending time with us over the next, the last two, um, day, um, two 12 days, hours. 12 hours, <laughs> it seems like. And of course, uh, Johan and, and Frederick from joining us um, internationally. And Jen, for all, as always, for putting these together. Um, we're gonna add additional sessions and Jen will make sure that you guys are aware and make sure that you check out our um, uh, signitedcom backslash webinars. She makes me make sure I says the SN to find out what additional ones that are coming. We have four planned for right now, and we are gonna to continue to add more. So thank you guys for and everybody for coming. Hopefully you had a good time and um, enjoyed hanging out as much as I did with Dave and the gang. So take care and we will talk to you soon.